Journal Entry Number 4 of Subject 6 While tidying up my room, there wasn't much else to do, with the faces all gone. I happened to catch a glimpse of something in the floor, through its light. It had been almost blinding to look at in the hours since the seeming source light was strengthened. Without eyelids, I had to face the faceless walls while sleeping. For a second, I... I caught sight of something in that ultra-luminous depth. An object of some kind, vaguely round, maybe 20 or 30 feet deep, far below the surface of the floor. I never really regarded it as a transparent or translucent thing. I'd always viewed it as a solid surface from which light somehow emitted. But I knew then, I came to realize with a sudden and undoubtable certainty that the floor was merely a transparent level beneath which existed something else. But I could only see the unknown object from a specific perspective, just beneath Greg's spot on the wall. Standing here facing the wall with my back flat, as, as flat as it can be to a curved surface, against the wall and looking at an angle about 60 degrees from my feet, I could see within the floor the object. Moving anywhere else obscured it in the harsh light, and trying to visibly focus on it also forced me to focus on the light, which subsequently made it harder to see the object. It was confounding. Frustrating. And after maybe five minutes of trying to figure out what it was, I gave up and I went back to cleaning. While scraping gunk into the waste hole, a thought came to me. What if I tried to see something in the ceiling, you know, following the same principle that perhaps there was something to see from a particular perspective vantage? So, I went to the center of the room, looking up, and I began walking around, first in a circular pattern, then in straight lines in the center in every direction, walking forward, backward, trying all kinds of bodily positions, but I didn't see anything after about 20 minutes, and I gave up on the endeavor. I cleaned up about as much as I could, so I went to my stack of thick leathery papers, intending to draw. I hadn't been forbidden from drawing. The idea hadn't occurred to me until then, but something about it, when I put the pen onto the paper, suddenly felt... felt wrong. Or rather, incompatible. As if I couldn't draw, rather than shouldn't. But I knew that I had always enjoyed doodling, and I tried to focus, to really think of something to draw. But no matter how hard I thought, nothing developed. My pen hovered uselessly above the paper, feminly embittered and more than a little frightened at the unexplainable inability to simply draw, I threw the pen and paper away from me. I watched the pen roll across the floor while the papers fluttered haphazardly above the floor. A few droplets of the wall water fell onto the paper that had come to settle, staining them blackly. I never wondered why the water was black. I simply drank it attributing its color to some admixture of sediment from the walls or above. It hadn't yet killed me, or even made me sick, so why wonder? But with everything gone, with my life falling apart for a second time, and that aggravating, inexorable light always in my face, I started to wonder, to really question my surroundings and situation for the first time. The delirium and dumb complacency that had persisted gnawed at my mind and prevented me from thinking clearly suddenly receded, and I was able to really take stock of my surroundings and be appropriately horrified by them. With a choking shock, I realized the utter state of decadence and squalor in which I had been living. Saw, almost with new eyes, the stinking, grime-encrusted hole a few feet from the heavy iron door in which I had for weeks deposited my bodily waste. 
I shrank away from the now oppressive walls, whilst also coming to newly and deeply fears of looming cavernous darkness above. And detesting with a mounting revulsion the unwholesome subterranean light beneath my unspeakably dirty feet. It was a pit of torture. And I had stupidly called it my room, had hung the blood spattered and wretched faces of dead people on its obsidian grime coated walls. And the faces. Oh God, the faces. I had warned them on my own, not my face, on the subdermal flesh, pink and raw beneath it. My face had been stolen from me, taken by my sadistic jailer, and in exchange he'd given me the faces some hideously figured, others, others frozen expressions of black terror as some kind of sick reparation for his abominable act. And I, driven insane by my predicament, had hung them on the disgustingly adhesive walls. I'd, I'd spoken to them, given them new names, personalities, and worst of all, worst of all, I applied them to my head and I, I'd worn them as masks to appear presentable to the very same men who had stripped me of my identity, uh, of my freedom. A compounding realization, this sudden and awful self-awareness were too much. I fell into my knees, gripping my raw face and screaming, not, not merely or even largely from the pain of the contact, but from the utter deplorable fate and cruelty to which I'd been subjected. I hadn't even in my life done anything to deserve such violence, such malice. I... I can't think of anyone who has. And that final and perhaps the most perplexing question came to me. How am I alive? Setting aside the fact that I had subsisted on strange black water and its gunk-like deposits for who knows how long, how had I not succumbed to an infection born of my raw flesh being exposed to an abysmally unhygienic environment? My nasal cavities, my eyes, my mouth, they all should have been horribly, incurably infected and rotting days or uh, weeks ago, and yet, yet while there had been pain, it's always tremendous pain, I had lived through it all. Lived with the necrotic tissue of over a dozen people affixed to my face, each for hours at a time. It was unreal, biomedically impossible. Coeval of this final self-directive and importantly unspoken inquiry, the light again brightened, becoming an almost tangible force from which I couldn't even turn away. It filled the room, becoming a mounting, fontic wave of physical sensation which rattled my bones with the sheer strength of its radiance. I was quickly bathed in its awful illumination as if the Earth's core had grown by several magnitudes. I arrived on the floor, unable to look away, unable to bear the omnipresent, agonizing light, and I was only spared from an even greater insanity by the sight above me, the newly illuminated ceiling of my abyssal pit center. In a moment of breathlessness, I watched as figures slowly resolved in the diminishing darkness. The once veiling shadows swept away by the still mounting light. A loud, sorrowful moan that escaped my lips, a, a wail of incredulity, terror, and grief all rolled into one. The figures of people, naked, hanging upside down by their ankles, their faceless heads swaying, dripping some strange black liquid. There were dozens, perhaps hundreds of them, swinging, gently rocking against one another from the soft vibrations of some unseen machinery or geological activity. Somehow the clanking of their chains had remained inaudible to me all this time. Somehow the collective corpse funk, putrid beyond expression, had not reached my nose until that very moment. Now the truth has been revealed to you. 
What will you do now? Come see me when you're able. The voice came from above. From beyond the carelessly suspended corpses. For a brief moment, I thought that one of them had spoken. The sound of my door opening quelled the hysteria that would have shortly arisen from, from that thought I turned away from the macabre sight. I was absolutely terrified. And knew that something darkly, horribly momentous was happening, but couldn't figure out what. And knew that the only way to get answers would be to play along, to let the horrible sequence of events continue. Far more afraid than I had ever been, I left my room, entering the second time that pitch-black corridor. This time it was lit by torches, intermittently placed along both walls. There was nothing of real interest illuminated by their solo light, but the overall impression was one of baleful expectancy. They seemed to augur some horrible fate, ushering me along with their strangely flickering flames. I hurried down the length of the corridor, wanting to reach my destination and end the awful anxiety. The room beyond had not changed. It was still the same incongruously homely dining room, something which looked like it had been transplanted from a nice countryside farmstead. The only strange thing about it were the framed pictures. All of apparent strangers. None of them looked alike, all positioned to face the dining table, a table that could never accommodate such a large gathering. My host was not here, so I continued on to the other door, the one I hadn't gone through during my previous visit. I was briefly disturbed by the embossed image of the massive face because for a moment I thought, thought that it had moved, still shifting its austere expression in some almost imperceptible way, but my mind quickly decided that I was only succumbing to the psychological effects of rattled nerves, and I quickly ignored the image. I reached for the knob, I opened the door, and I found myself staring into another hallway, this one artificially lit by regular lights panels on the ceiling. The walls were covered in the same yellow wallpaper that covered the dining room, and were similarly faded, of an unguessable age. There was no furniture in this hall, no decorations, just a dilapidated yellowness that verged on being dismal, eerie even. At the other end was a forked path, one hall leading to my right, another to my left with a framed picture of some stranger on the wall at their junction. The portrait, while in black and white, vaguely resembled the face embossed on the doors of the dining room. A severe expression glared at me with an air of almost puritanical judgment. There were black candles on a silver tray beneath it, three of them of equal size, all lit with little white flames. I sensed an importance in the man's appearance and an impression I gained more so from the image itself rather than its seemingly reverent placement in the hall. Take the path on the left, please. I obeyed the voice, which now sounded omnipresent rather than originating from some hidden speaker. I continued on down the left hall. At the end of this was a door similar in build to the one that sealed my room. Gripping the heavy iron handle, I wrenched it open and found myself staring into a room not dissimilar to my own, albeit much cleaner. Its walls were not slick with grime, its floor, while lit, was not harshly radiant, and there was no corpses that I could see suspending from its ceiling. There was, however, a short stone pedestal at the center of the room on which sat something I immediately recognized. My face. The skin had been preserved very well, and the wounds I'd been inflicted with during my capture were virtually unnoticeable. The light from the floor illuminated the face brilliantly, making it seem like some prize at the end of a long, nightmarish ordeal. I had almost forgotten what I looked like. I'd grown so accustomed to wearing the faces of others that mine almost seemed like a stranger's. I wanted to rush to it, to put it on and revel in the reacquisition of my identity, but there was... There was a sudden sound behind me. And turning around, I saw 
Him. I knew it was him. Despite the mask he was wearing, his figure immediately recognizable in my renewed mental clarity was sickly, somehow imposing, having in his frame a sense of authority. His hunched shoulders, bent arms, head perpetually cocked to the side, the same figure as the man in the hole in the wall. Nakedly wearing only the mask, he closed the door and stepped into the scope of the floor's soft light. When I got a clear view of the mask, I had a sudden rush of emotion, a powerful surge of familiarity, but I couldn't place the face. I couldn't recall which of my friends it had been. The man continued on past me, going to stand beside the pedestal. He gestured to my face with an air of showmanship, as if presenting some rare and costly artifact to an audience of bidders. With this, you can reclaim your identity. You can take back yourself and leave this place. The nightmare will end, and you'll be free. You need only to pick it up and apply it to your face. It will conform to your features. It will seamlessly reattach itself. I'll then escort you out. Or, and he gestured to his own face here, you may have this one. This beautiful, painstakingly carved collage of faces. An amalgamation of all those with whom you have developed such beautiful friendships. They're all here. In some way. An eye, a brow, a lip, a freckle, a mole, a whisker a strand of hair, a patch of skin. Everyone is here, in this face, stitched together. And if you choose to, you may forsake your boring, ordinary face, cast it into the dark, and wear this one. She could join this beautiful collective. The idea, of course, was ludicrous to me. At first, I laughed, almost insanely. But then the light dimmed, and the darkness above seemed to grow, to become more fulsome, and the mask, the composite one, somehow seemed more appealing, more attractive in the increasing dimness. I remembered all of the conversations I'd had with the faces, all imagined, of course, but conversations I had nonetheless enjoyed. I remembered Candace and Andrew's begrudging friendship, Greg's incurable bitterness, Hector's musings on love and the tireless march of time, I inescapably found myself strangely nostalgic over isolation-born delusions, over remembrances, madness, against reason and logic and all notions of self-preservation. I motioned for him to give me the Amalgamate mask. And like a historian dealing with a priceless antique, he gently removed it from his face and placed it on my eagerly outstretched hands. With comparable, if not greater care, I placed it on my face and smoothed it out so that it rested firmly and comfortably on my flesh. The sensation, unlike before, not was painful, but rather the opposite. There was a calming effect. Almost narcotic in nature, the mask smelled of chemicals, of flowers, of other unnameable things, but not of death and decay. As the others had smelled, the pain that ever persisted, the agony of my faceless flesh being exposed to the dungeon-like environment, it was also suppressed upon affixing the mask to the muscle and bone. And all at once, the faces spoke to me, telling me of their time away, how frightened they had been, how wonderful it felt to be joined together in one beautiful image. I listened, smiling along with them, and I heard dimly the departure of the man, of my generous mask maker. Uh, he must have come sometime later, because after I removed the face to drink some water, I didn't want to stain it. I saw a pile of papers, the thick, skin-colored pages I'd left behind in my own room. There was a note attached which said, Continue your work here if you'd like. This can be your new room. 
It's much cleaner. I'm sure you'll find it to your liking. And I do. I do like it. There's none of the rampant filth and decay. The light from the floor is dim, barely noticeable. The darkness above like a shadowy blanket. Also, incredibly, I can wear the new amalgamate mask for as long as I want without feeling any pain or even the mildest discomfort. It's perfectly suited to me. Better than my own face was. And now I needn't soil the faces by hanging them on the walls. They can all feel equally appreciated. No one is left out. Everyone has a voice, a chance to speak, a chance to be worn. As I write this, as I write this, they can see the words forming on the pages. They could provide input or ask for clarification. We're all in this together. We all wear the same face. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepasta. And I wanted to tell you, thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys are watching on YouTube, then that means you can find the podcast on Spotify or anywhere else that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you guys are listening on the podcast, hey, if you want to find some older episodes or a whole bunch of stories you've never seen before, you should check out youtube.com slash mrcreepypasta. And no matter where you are, I really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and hitting that bell reminder, just so that you can always find a new story as soon as it becomes available. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Pa patron? All my patrons on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff, like getting specific stories just for the channel. All those wonderful things that come from Dale Drake, those are because of all of you. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta like some of these wonderful guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchak, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Milton Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Butterhawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael. Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams. <laughs>